Hello, my name is Dan Silver, uh, and I am a member of the CRDCN board and a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of our Canadian and international participants today. We are very pleased that you are joining us for this virtual conference of the CRDCN presented in partnership with Statistics Canada. Today, the highlight is on education and social development. We are delighted to have four panelists who will share their experiences of how the CRDCN is advancing their research and informing policy. They will also discuss their aspirations for future data, research, and or policy development as part of this week's series, which is called Looking Back and Looking Forward, the Impact of CRDCN Research. Each of our panelists will present opening remarks of approximately six to seven minutes. As this portion of the kickoff has been pre-recorded, we invite you to submit your questions as you listen to each speaker. We will get to as many of them as possible in the live Q&A that will follow. Now I would like to invite our first speaker, Ross Finney, to kick off today's panel. Ross is full professor in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Ottawa and director of the Education Policy Research Inif Initiative, which is a national research organization based at the University of Ottawa. Take it away, Ross. Hello, it's a delight uh, to be here presenting to the conference. Uh, I've been asked to speak about my own experience with, in particular, longitudinal data, linked data sets, longitudinal data sets, uh, because frankly, I was involved from the very beginning. I was the first uh, outside academic researcher to work with uh, tax data uh, at Statistics Canada. And, uh, and then I was quite heavily involved in the development of the linked PIC tax data. And so this is a little bit my story, but also with the idea of uh, where, what the opportunities are going forward and uh, also how the, uh, the, the network could still uh, make contributions to uh, the efficiency of how we could best exploit these data. So, as I say, I heard, I got a whiff of the uh, longitudinal, the LAD, Longitudinal Administrative Database. It was the Longitudinal Administrative Database because it was the first. Um, and that was, uh, the history of that was the TIF, the family file, tax data on an annual basis were being developed by StatsCan in collaboration with the Economic Council of Canada. And someone said, gee, we have these annual files. Why don't we take the individuals in each year, link them over time, then we have a longitudinal data set. And uh, the two institutions put that together and the rest was history. Um, and some researchers, they were new and different and didn't look like regular data. There wasn't education, there weren't other things, but they had the strength of being basically 100% coverage of the population, massive sample sizes, even when sampled, accurate income data like never before and longitudinal. Uh, and that was the, those were the strengths and the idea was so you could run with those strengths in a way and do work that had never been done before uh, and highly poly, policy relevant. So I worked with the lab for many years at Statistics Canada. I was in a professional and personal place in my life where I was able to actually move to Ottawa to be at Statistics Canada. This is when the data liberation movement was just starting out. And, uh, but that's where I had to be. So that was before the network came along, of course, and now you can be wherever you are. Well, as long as you're near a research data center. I worked on poverty dynamics, earnings dynamics, all kinds of social assistance dynamics. I worked on mobility, interprovincial, international, uh, uh, typically in collaboration with various colleagues because I invested in the data to really understand the lad and that's one of the issues is that these data are complex on their own and they're doubly complex when put in a longitudinal framework and then uh, triply complex when you put a couple of those different to any more than one of those data sets together such as the education data so there are still barriers to using those data and I think that again that's where the uh, RDCs could come along. So I worked with various colleagues, uh, including Byron, uh, Charlie Beach, David Gray, uh, Ian Irvine, uh, and uh, others, because together we were strong and able to do lots of interesting things. Meanwhile, I was working with education data. First, the National Graduate Survey, which was kind of longitudinal, two points in time. Then I had the opportunity to work with the pieces, another longitudinal administrative data set. Uh, covering all PSE students in principle across the country. 
uh, each year, and those data were then you could link them longitudinally. So I was working with these longitudinal tax uh, education data, PSC, uh, track students through PSC, and then I was also working with these tax data, and I thought, put the two of them together, and what a resource. And I went to StatScan and uh, bugged them about it, and after some time, uh, Sylvie Michaud was the ACS at the time, she said, let's do a pilot. Ross, what do you want? Where do you want to go? I started with the University of Ottawa, so that was the first time PSC data were linked to tax data. And I focused on well, the big question of the day was, what do graduates earn year by year across discipline, across other uh, areas of study? And for the first time, really able to doc in, document uh, the graduates of the earnings of PSC graduates. That generated lots of interest, then supported to do a, a pilot with 14 institutions across the country. Uh, which became the Barista Project, because at the time, remember the myth that uh, PSE graduates didn't earn any more than a, a barista working at a cafe. And we were able to blow that myth out of the water, both uh, college graduates, university graduates, and looking at the range of field of study. Uh, and then uh, the success of those projects uh, helped uh, lead to the development of what is now the LMLP, Education Labor Market. Um, longitudinal file, or also often the pieces raised TIFF file, which is a wonderful resource. Uh, I used uh, also to replicate that work for the graduates across the entire country, uh, essentially 100% of all graduates. Uh, and uh, then the next frontier, adding in the K-12 data. And this is where I want to, uh, in particular, BC, uh, based on their wonderful PEM data, uh, personal education number data, which I think generates uh, the most, uh, I think that combination uh, is, well, I used to tell colleagues at conferences in Europe that these data were coming along and uh, that is the K-12 PSC and the tax data, they were envious, even my European Scandinavian colleagues to have that level of detail. So that's where we are. Uh, remarkable accomplishments, uh, integral participation, uh, contribution, importance of the, of the network. Uh, Statistics Canada doing great work moving this forward, supported by other government agencies, uh, ESTC in particular. Uh, so we're in a great spot. The one thing I would say though is that these data still have barriers to entry uh, because they're, as I said earlier, they're complex on their own, each one of them on an annual basis. Link them together longitudinally, each data set, the tax data, the pieces data, they get complex, or the K-12 data now. Uh, and then you start to put those together. So mixing combinations of complex longitudinal administrative databases is uh, required, is, uh, really understanding the data or at least getting a head start on that. And I think that's where the RDCs can still play a role, the network of lowering those barriers to entry and creating documentation, guides, anything we can do to help exploit these wonderful data we have. Thanks. Thanks for those uh, insightful comments. Uh, we're now going to move on to our next speaker, Susan McDaniel. Uh, Susan is fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Uh, she's professor of sociology, adjunct and research affiliate at the Institute on Aging and Lifelong Health at the University of Victoria and distinguished university professor at the University of Alberta. Susan, over to you. Thank you, Dan. I'm very pleased to be here. Hello, everybody. 20 years of the CRDCN network. It's hard to believe. I'm looking forward very much to the panels uh, that we'll, we'll hear from in the celebratory event. Congratulations to the network. In the past 20 years, there's been a tsunami of evidence-based insights into the relation of education and social development uh, from data analyzed in the RDCs. Key to these analyses, diverse as they are, are two things. Access to uh, data that is longitudinal, which means following individuals over time and lives, and increasingly uh, data that is linked across domains. Both of these comprise empirical manifestations of a life course perspective, traversing life courses and interdependencies across domains, such as work, family, education, health, and several more. 
Looking at CRDCN research over the past 20 years yields a plethora of insights, far too many to do justice to in a very short talk. Sorting those listed on the website uh, by education yields 316 articles. I'm quite sure there are more than that because some people haven't uploaded all of their articles, but 316 is a lot. I shall only note a very small sample. The effects of family income and parental education on outcomes remain. Interestingly, it's been found that effects of parental education on access to post-secondary education is stronger than that of family income. Labor market uh, conditions affect post-secondary education as well, with demand increasing with unemployment trends. Now, this is something that seems very important in the times of uh, COVID. Gaps persist between first-generation university grads and others, particularly for men, which is something that probably uh, is important for policy. Canadians without a bachelor's degree are far more likely to experience a birth within cohabitation and their likelihood of transitioning to marriage uh, has declined steeply across birth cohorts. And at the other end of the age spectrum, interestingly, daycare, we're not talking necessarily about uh, a, a early childhood education, but daycare is not an unmitigated uh, benefit for kids' social development. One of the early important insights gleaned from the RDC analysis that was of interest to uh, a skeptical chief statistician uh, early on in the development of the, the um, RDC, CRDCN was that good parenting was as important to advantaged families as less advantaged families to good outcomes for children. So lower income is certainly not deterministic, but nor is high income, which is a very important insight. Nonetheless, the pattern that emerges clearly is diverging destinies for advantaged and those less advantaged. No doubt these divergences will continue and have been exacerbated by the COVID, COVID uh, outbreak and uh, the accompanying economic crisis. In the two RDC projects that I've led and am leading, and equality in midlife looking toward the later years, a US-Canada comparison, and cumulative inequalities in health outcomes mid to later life. We find that the usual socioeconomic gradient to, and health status across life course remains, and this is for all measures of health, including financial health, which is something we, we measured. Examining the independent effect of education is yet to come in our work. CRDCN is truly the synchrotron for the social sciences, enabling deep insights into how lives play out in various social structures with education being among the most central. Yet there's much more that we, could, we do not know that would be helpful for policy. What we tend to do, guided by the ways in which data are collected, is ask a lot of silo questions, good questions, but questions in silo. For example, about post-secondary education and its role in access. These are very good questions, but we need to know more across silos and across entire lives. We know that inequalities of all sorts make a huge difference to life chances, even to life expectancies, but know less about the specific role education plays and education in all its dimensions, not just educational attainment. Following individuals throughout lives and education is difficult because good data are sketchy at certain points, but would be vital to know about. The novel shock of uh, the pandemic crisis and its accompanying economic crisis raises more questions about what we don't know. A sharp fault line seems to have been exposed by gender, race, parenthood status, income, employment type, and likely more. Whether this is uh, clear by education, we don't yet know but it would be interesting to see if that's the case. This is huge in determining what has been hit hardest, who has been hit hardest, and who will likely need the most policy support moving forward. In an era where uh, rumors abound, and uh, sometimes pass as facts, uh, we need sound research. Good data and deep insights have never been greater. One last point, and I think this is important, so I'd like to raise it. The CRDC net and network has wisely promoted and encouraged communities of scholars. All good. That said, widening of communities in future could assist in making research policy visible and implementable. A project I led some years ago with my deceased colleague, Paul Bernard, 
um, it brought together academic researchers and policymakers to focus on life course as a policy lens across several domains. Some of that work was published as a special issue of Canadian public policy. The crucial takeaway, and I'll end with this, I would like to share with you here is the beauty and possibility of policy people working together with academic researchers right at the outset of the research, adding synergistically to each other's perspectives. This is done, but I'm encouraging more of it. More of this would be welcome and could simultaneously benefit both policy and research. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was uh, wonderful. Uh, to me, the metaphor of the CRDCN as a kind of cyclotron for social science is particularly powerful and speaks to the crucial role of basic social science research infrastructure uh, to fundamental knowledge and policy application. Um, now, continuing on with our program, we're going to move to our next distinguished speaker. Uh, we turn to Guy Lacroix to take the floor who is full professor in the economics department of Laval University and Cyrano researcher and fellow. Guy is also a former member of the CRDCN board. Take it away, Guy. Merci beaucoup. Alors, euh, écoutez, je suis très, très heureux et euh, honoré d'être invité à participer à ce panel. Euh, moi, je suis quelqu'un qui s'intéresse à l'évaluation des politiques publiques et donc je suis un consommateur euh, avis de, de données et j'ai pensé que la meilleure façon que je pouvais témoigner de la pertinence et de l'importance du réseau des données canadiennes, c'est qu'en fait, c'est de l'illustrer avec quatre études que j'ai faites récemment et qui sont toutes appuyées sur les données du, du réseau. Alors, je vais donc présenter et résumer très brièvement quatre études qui font appel à sept banques de données différentes, uniquement disponibles dans le réseau, pour montrer un petit peu l'importance pour nous et pour moi en particulier euh, d'avoir accès à ce genre de données-là. Alors, si on voulait simplement euh, montrer euh, la première présentation. Alors, la première étude euh, dont je parlais, c'est une étude que j'ai faite avec mes collègues de HEC à Montréal. Et euh, ça portait, en fait, sur le... On essaie de trouver euh, une espèce de lien causal euh, entre l'éducation et la santé et la mortalité. Et donc, euh, on s'est tourné vers une enquête qui venait tout juste d'être mise à notre disposition, qui est la cohorte « Santé et environnement ». Et on s'est basé là-dessus pour être capable de retracer des hommes qui avaient entre 18 et 24 ans au moment de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Et on a pu les suivre euh, tout le long de leur vie jusqu'à leur mort à partir des années 90. Et donc, de mesurer dans, dans, la mesure dans laquelle des politiques qui avaient été mises en place après la guerre pour ces hommes-là, qui favorisaient l'accès à l'université, avaient pu influencer sur leur espérance de vie. Alors, on avait des, des, des militaires qui revenaient de la guerre, qui étaient admissibles au programme, d'autres ne l'étaient pas. Et on a pu comparer l'espérance de vie de ces hommes-là plus tard dans la vie, en raison du fait de leur participation ou pas. Alors, on a trouvé qu'il y avait un effet causal indéniable de la, de la scolarité sur l'espérance de vie. Et cette étude-là était basée sur la cohorte santé et environnement, mais également sur deux autres banques de données, l'enquête nationale sur la santé des populations et l'enquête sur la santé dans les collectivités. Alors, une seule étude, trois banques de données et les trois accessibles uniquement dans un centre de données de recherche. L'autre étude dont j'aimerais parler, c'est euh, je me suis intéressé à l'impact de, des programmes qui avaient été implantés au Québec dans les années 90, des programmes très progressistes qui euh, portaient notamment sur les garderies subventionnées, sur les, euh, le régime d'assurance parentale et sur toute une foule de, de, de politiques qui avaient été introduites à cette époque-là dans une période où, en Ontario, contrairement au Québec, on avait plutôt des politiques un peu plus répressives pour inciter les gens à travailler. Alors, au Québec, on voulait leur offrir des services de garde à frais réduits, des congés parentaux généreux, alors qu'en Ontario, c'est plutôt l'inverse. Alors, je me suis posé la question, est-ce que ces politiques-là ont eu un effet d'augmenter la, la mobilité dans l'échelle de revenus? Et j'ai donc comparé le Québec et l'Ontario de 1983 à 2010, avec les données de la Banque de données administratives longitudinales. Et ce que j'ai trouvé, c'est que la politique mise en place au Québec n'ont pas aidé à la mobilité, n'ont pas nuit non plus, n'ont eu aucun effet. Par contre, ces politiques-là ont eu un effet sur la pauvreté, mais pas sur la mobilité en tant que telle. Alors, encore une fois, cette étude-là a pu être réalisée parce que j'avais deux provinces de comparaison et j'avais des bandes de données tout à fait appropriées. Le troisième article dont j'aimerais parler, euh, C'est une étude que je fais en ce moment même et avec mon collègue Charles Belmar de Laval et Nathalie Acuy à la Banque euh, du Canada. Et là, on s'intéresse euh, à l'intégration, la performance de l'intégration économique des immigrants au Canada. 
Alors, euh, beaucoup d'études au Canada sur euh, la performance économique, c'est basé sur une enquête longitudinale, un panel de trois vagues, et euh, pour, pour étudier toutes sortes de, de facettes de l'intégration des immigrants. Le problème avec l'enquête longitudinale, c'est qu'il y a un taux d'attrition relativement élevé dans les données d'un panel à l'autre. Alors, ce qu'on a eu comme idée, c'est de se baser sur la base de données longitudinales sur l'immigration, une banque de données administratives jointe avec des données d'enquête, pour reproduire exactement le même échantillonnage que l'enquête longitudinale auprès des immigrants. Alors, on a reproduit une enquête à partir de données administratives avec les mêmes propriétés statistiques. La principale différence, c'est que dans la banque de données longitudinales, on observe l'attrition. Et la principale attrition qu'on observe au Canada, c'est une, une attrition, en fait, interprovinciale. Ce n'est pas des immigrants qui retournent chez eux, il y en a, mais essentiellement entre les provinces. Et une fois qu'on a tenu compte de ça, ce qu'on montre dans notre papier, qui, qui sera publié bientôt, c'est qu'en fait, la performance des immigrants, si on la mesure avec des données administratives, est meilleure que lorsqu'on la mesure avec des données d'enquête, qui sont contaminés par des biais d'attrition. Et finalement, bon, ben, pour faire un petit peu euh, euh, un rappel de ce qui vient d'être dit euh, par ma collègue euh, de, 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 de l'Alberta, ben, écoutez, moi, il y a quelques années, le gouvernement du Québec m'avait demandé euh, de travailler avec eux pour évaluer euh, l'effet du régime euh, québécois d'assurance parentale. Alors, bien sûr, j'ai eu accès aux données administratives du ministère, mais je me suis basé aussi sur une foule d'enquêtes euh, de la couverture de l'assurance-emploi pour regarder quel avait été l'effet comparatif au Québec et à l'Ontario de la mise en place d'un régime euh, de, de Québécois d'assurance parentale, notamment sur la prise de, de congés de maternité, de paternité et de, et de parentale. Et ce qu'on a de montrer, c'est qu'en fait, les hommes euh, ont été extrêmement nombreux à se prévaloir des congés euh, de paternité, mais également des congés de euh, parental partagés avec leur conjointe, et ça n'a eu aucun effet ni sur l'emploi, ni sur les revenus des mères de famille. Donc, euh, donc, la pertinence pour le gouvernement, elle est très grande, elle est évidente. Et il y a une demande aussi bien du point de vue académique que du point de vue gouvernemental pour avoir accès à ce genre de données-là. Alors, moi, si j'avais un vœu à formuler en guise de conclusion, c'est que beaucoup des programmes au Canada sont gérés par euh, les provinces, en particulier au Québec. Et ce qui serait pertinent pour nous, comme économistes, mais également comme chercheurs gouvernementaux, c'est éventuellement d'avoir accès aux données provinciales dans les centres de données de recherche du Canada. Et euh, ça pourrait faciliter la comparaison entre les provinces, entre les programmes. On a une richesse de programmes d'une province à l'autre. Et ça vaudrait la peine d'exploiter cette variété-là pour être capable d'identifier les effets causaux ou les conséquences, l'efficacité des programmes. Alors, voilà ce que j'avais à dire. Et puis là-dessus, ben, je souhaite un 20e anniversaire, un heureux 20e anniversaire au réseau. Longue vie et euh, prospérité. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you, Guy. That was a wonderful demonstration of how access to the RDCs can make it possible to, produce, to pursue research and policy questions that would not have been possible otherwise. Now we're going to move on to our final speaker, Keith Godam, Assistant Deputy Minister of the Governance and Analytics Division in the Government of British Columbia. Keith is also the Ministry's Executive Lead on Labor Relations and serves on the board of the BC Public School Employers Association. All right, well, hello from uh, Victoria. My name is Keith Godin, Assistant Deputy Minister of Education. Uh, absolutely delighted uh, to, to be here and share and engage, um, you know, with all of you on this, uh, on this topic. Uh, you know, I'm going to spend my few minutes talking about uh, the why, the what, and the how uh, of how we've linked our uh, kind of K-12 student data with Statistics Canada. So I'll start with the why. So, you know, it sounds maybe somewhat, uh, somewhat trite, but uh, it's actually very, very important to have our compass set right. Uh, and the reason we do all of this uh, in, in government is, is to help kids. And, you know, really understanding what happens to students after K-12 helps better policy decisions throughout their K-12 experience. And what we've even found statistically, uh, that can manifest as early as, uh, as kindergarten in terms of, uh, you know, some of those, some of those decisions. And it's really part of our broader vision of understanding uh, everything that happens uh, in, in a kid's life that helps to hinder success in the classroom, outside the classroom. Uh, and for the economists out there, uh, we are looking to maximize our R squared to understand all the variation that, that happens in kids' life. Uh, again, linked back to, to making better policy decisions within, within government. Uh, and the second, uh, you know, kind of reason for the why uh, that's really linked back to, to this group 
is more research. Um, and w I understand that the philosophy of, you know, kind of research and uh, engaging with government does ebb and flow over time. Uh, but what I can tell you now is uh, certainly from British Columbia, we are very interested in enabling independent research uh, in post-secondary institutions and, and, and more broadly across researchers, uh, but also directly with us. Uh, there's a, a tremendous uh, kind of skill set uh, that, that's out there. Uh, we have a skill set too within the ministry and we're looking to, um, uh, to engage on that front as well. So the second piece on on the on the what, uh, and happy to follow up with uh, you know with anyone to um, to engage in this in more detail. But you know essentially, British Columbia has a personal education number, a unique identifier for every student that goes back to 1992. Uh, it includes student characteristics, achievement information. It's extremely well organized and categorized and and secure in our in our databases. Uh, essentially, we took all of that and uh, linked that to Statistics Canada files, income files, uh, census, labor force, post-secondary. It is, uh, I don't think I'm understating that it is a profound uh, kind of platform with which to do statistical analysis over time. Uh, and uh, similar to Ross's comments, you know, we have engaged with our European colleagues and uh, even in a global context, um, you know, we're quite, uh, quite optimistic uh, that this is going to provide some, some real powerful insight into, um, uh, into students' lives. Uh, and the third piece of the what, of course, is enabling uh, others to use this through the research data centers and ultimately to contribute to, uh, to analysis. Uh, so next, uh, next slide, um, just one uh, very, very brief example, uh, the proverbial tip of the iceberg here where we could get uh, into extreme richness of the data, but just to show you, uh, you know, the pathway that comes from certain metrics, so reading, writing, uh, that comes in grade four and numeracy in, in grade seven to various provincial exams and course marks, uh, transitioning that into uh, post-secondary and then of course looking at long-term uh, income ta or income files uh, and uh, and the outcomes for that is is incredibly powerful, and, and this just a very very simple example of what's the income trajectories of those that complete high school and those that don't, uh, and to having that foundation and and again of course there's an incredible richness uh, that goes uh, that goes deeper into this. So on to the next uh, next slide, another quick example of direct policy application. Uh, you know, British Columbia is deeply committed uh, to, to reconciliation and working with uh, rights holders in the province. Uh, and a big part of our uh, analytical framework is understanding, the, you know, the differences and the reasons for those differences between Indigenous and non-Indigenous outcomes. Uh, so again, just scratching the surface here, but uh, this is very powerful insight uh, that you know, there's a lot of anecdotes out there, uh, but this provides us the empirical foundation to, um, uh, to make lives better uh, through, through policy decisions. So I'll close out on, uh, on the how. Uh, you know, I think if I could leave anything with, uh, with this group, uh, there is a huge opportunity uh, to work together across sectors, juris you know, jurisdictions, different fields of inquiry. There's different types of expertise I know in, in, in this group. Uh, you know, British Columbia for one, but I think this extends to others. Uh, further investing in our data linkage capability, uh, getting more uh, kind of access uh, to researchers, of course, in a very secure uh, way to, uh, to manage the integrity of the data, of course. Uh, but we, we have to extend uh, kind of the reach of, um, uh, of access to these data. Uh, second kind of piece is, you know, British Columbia is, uh, you know, kind of open for business here for, for research. Uh, you know, we're looking for, for partners to understand this data. I mean, we could spend a lifetime uh, on, on looking at this data and, and still only get to, to a fraction of it. Uh, and then I think the, the last piece is to, to utilize uh, CRCDN, the research network, uh, through the data centers. Um, you know, to the extent that British Columbia can contribute to that as, uh, as policymakers, we are, um, we, we are absolutely happy to do that. Um, so I know that was, so I know that was uh, short and sweet, uh, but certainly want to leave the audience with, with a commitment for follow-up. Uh, and we're happy to, uh, to have a conversation with, um, uh, with anyone who's, uh, who's interested in partnering on this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith, for those uh, wonderful remarks. Uh, this now concludes the pre-recorded portion of the spotlight on education and social development. We invite you to please stand by as we transition to the live Q&A session with our panelists. If you have yet to do so,
please submit your questions. The live Q&A is starting now. We are now live. And welcome from whatever time zone you happen to be in. I still am Dan Silver uh, from the University of Toronto, uh, Department of Sociology and the CRDCN board. And um, we are delighted to have you here for this um, exciting spotlight session on education and social development. We've just heard four really fascinating recorded presentations, which were admirably brief, but at the same time, very rich. So I think we have a lot to talk about. Um, you've got a chance now uh, to have some discussion with our esteemed panelists. If you haven't already done so, please submit your questions via the Q&A function that we have um, set up there in Zoom. And um, feel free to keep adding them as our conversation unfolds. One thing I want to note before we get going is that uh, Guy Lacroix could not be with us today. He's teaching a class right now. That said, if you have any questions that uh, were raised by uh, Guy's presentation, feel free to go ahead and ask them and maybe one of the other panelists um, could, could speak, speak to that. Um, so let me uh, kick things off. I'll look at what questions we've received so far. And I'll start with this one we have here um, for Ross. Um, Ross, um, this comes from Yasin Kaya. Ross, you mentioned that there are some barriers due to the complexity of the administrative and linked uh, data sets. Um, could you perhaps elaborate on what the government could do to overcome these barriers? And let me, uh, Dan Silver, add not just maybe the government, but also the CRDCN or academic researchers. What can the various players do to help to sort of uh, lower those barriers to entry and reduce the learning curve to using these important data sets? Uh, yeah, uh, well, first thing is uh, good documentation of the data. Uh, it can always be improved, it can always be better. But uh, more specifically, it, you have to remember that these, uh, these data are constructed uh, cross-section. And so with no answer put together, no checking longitudinal. And sometimes, uh, and sometimes the data can have inconsistencies over time. For example, the tax data, I remember trying to put together, uh, identify, well, Susan, uh, you published one of my first pieces on what happens in incomes of divorce. Uh, and to track through marital status is listed uh, on a cross-sectional basis. Uh, but sometimes people might not answer it consistently over time, in particular the links are otherwise missed over time, linkages. So to accurately identify when uh, a partnership moves from uh, into split couple, uh, you really have to check uh, longitudinal and you have to allow for errors in the data, uh, missing years of data, uh, people just not you know, not filling out the marital status form uh, category in, in, uh, in an accurate way. Um, just as an example, so to put together when a divorce occurs, or to put together the birth of, uh, identify the birth of each additional child, uh, to put all, especially those longitudinal uh, relationships. Um, more could be done to at least uh, warn people, researchers, of the hazard, because they're not like long uh, constructed longitudinal databases like StatScan where they say to you back you know, previous time, this is what things are, what are they now, that sort of thing. And otherwise, just being aware, you know, what are the categories, what are the variables, but especially on the longitudinal and especially when you put uh, two or three data sets together. So fuller documentation and to the degree possible, at least point people in the direction of what they need to be aware of. Uh, because I know there was actually some early work on divorce they, on uh, income uh, poverty dynamics that uh, were perhaps not as meticulous about checking things longitudinally. So then you could get uh, uh, Family is missing an income member in one year, so it looks like they they tumble into poverty and then they're out the next year. And, but all it is is uh, a gap in the data. So that sort of thing, the richness of the data, there's only so far. Uh, 
general documentation can go, but at least warnings, and then maybe templates of programs that could at least point people in the direction. Otherwise, everyone's inventing the wheel from the beginning. And wheels are difficult things to invent, and they take a lot of time. Uh, and uh, so it's inefficient. And so that's what I mean by lowering the batteries. And a very functional process. That's why I work with all my colleagues. I've done that. They're the expertise. They came in. Let's do this work. But you're relying on an individual and those programs. That's a pretty precarious sort of uh, set of relationships. Thanks. Thanks, Ross. Yeah, that, that's that's really helpful. And it's going to be a challenging problem going forward. There's going to be so many wheels. Um, the um, next question we have here is, is for Keith Godin. Um, could you talk about how the ways in which the BC government has benefited from partnering with the CRDC and researchers, specifically to inform its policies, and what kind of implications you would see from the lessons you've learned from that for other, other governments? Yeah, Keith here, no, great, uh, no, no great question. It's certainly been um, uh, kind of a, a journey for us. I mean, you know, kind of the first thing is it takes a little bit of leap of faith uh, for, for governments to start sharing data. Uh, you know, outside of their borders. So, you know, that, that's a, um, I would almost say a philosophical uh, position, but, you know, kind of strategic one is, as well. So, you know, as soon as we get through that, um, you know, kind of first piece and, uh, you know, maybe not in a COVID context, but um, pre-COVID, you know, we flew to Ottawa and relationships matter, human connection matters. And we met with Anil and his, and his team and, um, you know, developed a relationship there of how, of how this, would be, this would be done and enabled uh, through, uh, through the research network. So, so those early foundations were, were fundamentally in, important. Um, you know, in terms of informing public policy, it's, I didn't use that word lightly profound. I mean, I've been an economist background, researching kind of background in public policy. To be able to connect, um, you know, the, the, the citizen pathway, the student pathway from, you know, age four uh, now into kind of 40s, 50s, 60s in terms of uh, where they went to post-secondary, uh, what jobs they're in, what they earn. Uh, and then illuminating that backwards to make policy decisions is, is incredibly powerful. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a little bit of a skill set to, to bridge, um, you know, ac academic like kind of research and complicated data tables and all that into, into public policy language. Uh, but that bridge can be built. Uh, and as soon as we do that, then, then yes, you can walk into, you know, kind of cabinet chambers and, and have a conversation about what types of things should be shifted, um, you know, particularly in the early years. Um, this is the rate of return uh, to, uh, to kind of individual prosperity uh, over, over time. And these are the types of kind of decisions that, um, uh, that we should make, you know, kind of very early on in a, in a student's life. So, uh, there's lots more to that question, of course, but um, you know, at, at a high level, uh, we found a tremendous value uh, in doing it ourselves, but also enabling this through through the research network. Excellent, Thank, thanks, Keith. Uh, okay, now our next question is uh, for Susan and perhaps Ross, if if you're if you want to add anything as well. Um, there's some interest in finding more about sort of shorter term data related to education, you were speaking mostly about the really long term data. And, the que and behind the question is an interest in, for example, understanding the impact of COVID-19 on enrollment, university and college en enrollments, or what's the impact of like a long term absence from school um, on, on learning for K through 12 students, especially for special needs students. So how can we use these data sources to get at these kind of important questions of the moment? Uh, well, this is a very important question and one that um, I and I'm sure others on the panel have struggled with. Keith just mentioned the leap of faith that's required for um, provinces to share data and other jurisdictions, of course, to share data, to have them linked. But there's also a leap of faith uh, on, on the part of academics to move into short term analysis, but also uh, a, a kind of difficult a challenge, a practical challenge that we face uh, with RDCs being closed uh, largely, they're opening now, but being closed during, during the pandemic, 
the notion of remote access would, would certainly help us to do short-term analysis, but the approval processes sometimes that we need to leap through, which are quite onerous and justly so to protect the data uh, and the RDCs, makes it uh, complicated, challenging, let's put it that way, to do short-term analysis. Uh, another barrier that I see, and I'm not trying to, to talk only about barriers, but there are many, uh, would be the, the difficulty, and I think that um, Keith was, was getting at that, the difficulty that academics and policy people on both sides have building those relationships. Uh, that sometimes those take a bit of time, and speaking as an academic, who's been working with policy people for a long time, as I mentioned in my talk, um, many academics see policy as kind of a black box. They're not sure who to contact, how to make the connections, how to develop the relations. So if you're going to do good research, I emphasize that the, 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 the policy and academic um, collaboration right at the beginning of research, particularly policy relevant research, would be useful. So they're on the ground to start with. It's not something that pops out of academic research after the fact. But developing those quickly, not straightforward. So, so I think we need to move, if I could just have a wish list, I think we may need to move more quickly and decrease some of the barriers that are involved, some of which the network could work on. Uh, to, to develop policy relevant research that's well done, but done on a quick turnaround basis. And we're not so good at that right now, in my view. Thanks, Susan. Um, Dan, may I? All right, do you want to jump in, Keith? Yeah, please, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, because uh, I think there's, um, there's certainly agree with Susan on, uh, on a number of points. I mean, first, um, yeah, the access to, to the RDCs, I mean, our, our, our team included. Uh, right over the last uh, the last several months, so you know, kind of deploying some some technology there to to enable that um, access, I, I think, is important. Um, but you know, I think the other aspect to this is uh, we'll look at this panel. Um, you know, we've combined worlds of of public policy and and uh, you know academia, and quite frankly, I think we need more of it. Um, you know, I'm not I don't think I'm alone uh, in in BC or here with my provincial colleagues and federal colleagues wanting to develop that bridge um, and, and quite frankly you know I, I'm empathetic to to academics because on the government side of things access does ebb and flow the the culture of enabling data uh, ebbs and flows over time uh, so that's why I said I, I can only speak for myself now that you know we're, we're open for business but um, you know I, I think these types of forums I think are, are quite helpful uh, and, and kind of directly to, to the specific question, uh, certainly in BC, because we have a personal education number, um, we have a mountain of, of short-term data. Uh, we do daily attendance for every single student in the province, you know, 640,000 students. Um, you know, we kind of track uh, every aspect of vulnerable populations. Um, and, and it's a good example where, like, we just can't get to all that analysis. And this is where uh, kind of external expertise can, can help us answer some of those questions. So. Uh, anyway, I think just you know, kind of congrats to the organizers here. This is the type of bridge that we're we're trying to build. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here that's for Keith, and it's a sort of more a specific or sub substantive question, which is any anything you might be able to say about the impact of re uh, the removal of the provincial examinations in secondary schools on the ability to track the pathways of students reliably over time. And it, I guess it goes to a general question about, you know, how we as research have to, researchers have to deal with the ways that the data sets change and the categorizations change over time. Yeah, no, good question. So, and this question doesn't come without controversy within the British Columbia context. So I'll, I'll be quite diplomatic here, but, um, you know, kind of straight to the point, the impacts are, uh, you know, we, we can no longer compare uh, say course marks with kind of a standardized assessment at, at, at certain milestones. Um, although we have a lot of historical data that enables us to do that, that data is still there, uh, you know, up until um, uh, 2016. Uh, however, we've introduced, you know, kind of other provincial assessments, you know, kind of literacy 10, uh, numeracy 10, uh, and another one in um, uh, grade 12 on literacy as well. So, those are slightly different assessment structures. However, it enables the same type of thing. Uh, you want to be able to see if there's things like 
systemic racism of, uh, you know, kind of low expectations of, you know, kind of course marks again, and what are, what are the standardized kind of assessments telling us? So, so you know, we've, um, you know, you're not going to have full continuity there because of different assessment structures, but we've replaced it with, uh, with other type of metrics. Uh, and then the other thing that's, that's quite important is those are just kind of key things in secondary years. Um, if you think about the entire K-12 pathway, there is, you know, lots of other markers with which to, uh, to make comparisons across cohorts. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we've got a lot of great questions coming in. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Keep them coming. Um, uh, here's one for Ross and Susan um, from an anonymous uh, attendee. Um, and this is a question asking about, well, given the, you know, the range and the length of the studies that you've already worked on and your sort of knowledge of the areas, what would you be able to put together a sort of set of suggestions for other additional data or comparisons or topics that junior researchers could, could pick up on who uh, could pursue them in the CRDCN, given that you, no individual is going to have time to get to all of them. So if you were get, putting a sort of like wish list of here's what I'd like the, the next generation of researchers to be doing in the CRDCN, what, what would you be able to tell them? Oh, you're on mute, Ross. Oh, okay. Good. Uh, well, I have my own ideas about what I want to do and to be honest, dig into the literature, dig into the data and figure out where you think would be interesting to do. That's, uh, uh, it's anonymous. I don't know what that means, but if you're a grad student or a junior researcher, uh, find out what you find interesting, uh, what your questions are, or what the data can handle. That's part of the art, of course. What can the data do to answer questions? You have to put those two things together. So on that one, go for it. <laughs> Thank Susan, anything to add there? Uh, well, this is always uh, an interesting question. Um, I would say that there are lots and lots of questions coming yeah. out of the tail end of contemporary research, lots and lots. Uh, almost every uh, uh, journal article you read in the contemporary uh, world, I just read several this morning online, has um, what will the effects be of uh, an, an amazing um, event or an amazing situation we face under COVID. It's a global issue, but it's not hitting everyone equally. What are the short and longer term implications for educational opportunity, for attainment, for, for success if you have education? How does that work? It's just a, just a mountain of questions. Uh, and the BC example is such an exemplary one for how we could begin to answer those questions and make it directly relevant to policy. But there's lots of data that we can use to look at educational inequalities, for example. And I'm not just talking about my passion here. I'm talking about, you know, what we don't know. And what we don't know is increasingly descending on our heads that we thought we knew a whole lot more than we do. And when we have a crisis, a dual crisis of health and, um, and economics at the same time, uh, we find out we don't know as much as we think we do. And so to dig into those data now, it would be a real opportunity for a, a junior researcher to make a career. And so I would encourage that. Uh, great. Uh, the, uh, here's another question now for, for Keith, but anybody else who has ideas here, I think would be encouraged to jump in. And it's, it's really a question asking about uh, who, what other, jurisdictions or governments uh, do you think uh, might be open to these kinds of partnerships and how we can connect uh, all of them together. And let me add just one other, this is mine, and this maybe you talked about the leap of faith, and this might be one too far for the moment, but um, you mentioned, you know, international compar comparisons and other governments that are, that have similar kind of administrative data available. I assume you're thinking of like Sweden or Germany. Um, one thing that would be very powerful is more of to make possible more of those international comparisons, like putting together our Canadian data with these with data from these other countries, which is very challenging to do right now. So, any thoughts on um, a, the possibility of, of 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 that kind of comparison being on the horizon? So, there's two questions: that is an international one, and then the other one about what other Canadian jurisdictions might be as open to this kind of uh, collaboration as, uh, as 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 you are, Keith. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, fun questions, by the way. Uh, this is uh, that was fantastic. Um, 
So yeah, I think on it's kind of the first one around uh, what other Canadian jurisdictions should do. Uh, I mean, you know, being in public policy, I think that that's that's up to them. Um, what what I can say is we're happy to share our story. Uh, you know, we're happy to explain how you know again we you know, kind of brokered this with Statistics Canada and then enabled it through uh, through the research network. Um, you know, how as, as kind of senior public servants, we would convince politicians to, to do this and why this is a good thing uh, in, in the long-term interest of, uh, of, of citizens. So again, that's a calculus that each jurisdiction is going to have to make on their own. But, you know, my answer to that is I, I'm help, uh, you know, happy to kind of share our story to, uh, to, to help them do that. In, in the international space, I mean, again, quite uh, quite quickly, um, you know, I've interacted with OECD a number of times, um, and you know, in a very Canadian way, you know, kind of humbly explained, you know, what our you know kind of linkage capabilities are, um, and they were like, what? Uh, like it, it is in a global context uh, to be able to have again this unique identifier tracking characteristics, demographics. Uh, all the way through K to 12 to to the labor market and post secondary is um, is unique and there's certainly other inter European countries that have some elements of this uh, you know connections across kind of social services but um, it, it and I'm not an expert in all those but it seems like we're onto something special here um, and and I think to, to some of those questions about you know income comparability and this is where you know I think the likes of um, you know professional academics you know can make those appropriate comparisons, um, right? And where you're comparing incomes, you know, you're making some inferences across across systems. Uh, again, it's another example where we've loaded the data into the data centers. Um, over to you. Uh, Dan, may yeah, I please. add yeah, something to that? that. Um, I just wanted to add two points if I could. The first one is that doing international comparisons with RDC data is not straightforward. Uh, when I was doing, I mentioned I was doing a study uh, compared the U.S. and Canada, the U.S. data were, were publicly available, but in order to not have to run back and forth between offices and the RDC to make the comparison, I had to put the, U we, I'm sorry, the team had to put the U.S. data into the RDC, and then the U.S. data, which was already publicly available, had to be vetted out of the RDCs again. So trying to put in more countries would, I mean, it, would, it creates practical issues. We can surmount those, but, but people doing international data have to be, uh, data analysis have to be aware of those practical issues. Second thing I want to mention about the collaboration between policy and, um, and academics. When I was in Alberta, I tried to put together the similar kind of thing to what uh, has been done in BC with different data, with health data, but nonetheless, I tried to put it together. And what happened there was that the leap of faith, to use Keith's term, on both sides didn't work. On either the government side or the academic side, both were afraid of the dancing together. So, so uh, it didn't work. Now, it might have been that I didn't uh, you know, work out enough diplomatic skills, but the notion of this leap of faith is not only with policy people, it's also with academics who aren't sure they want to dance with policy people. So, so uh, these kinds of challenges are quite real. In, uh, in, um, and then, of course, the last point, and it's a very quick one, but it's something everybody knows, every Canadian is familiar with, about provincial federal jurisdiction. And the province is saying, those are my data. You can't mix them with federal data. We can't have that kind of mixing. So uh, that story is a long, hard one to break. But it should be mentioned because it's tricky. Thank you. Yeah, those are terrific points. And actually, the next question builds on that uh, for, for Ross and Susan from Gustav Goldman, um, pointing out that the administrative data that we have is uh, health, education, social programs, mostly coming from the provinces, um, but that means that they're not necessarily comparable across jurisdictions because each province is doing the collection and categorization uh, in their own way, uh, which presents a challenge and an opportunity to the research community to try to overcome that barrier. Uh, or what is your thoughts on the possibility of overcoming those, those barriers and making those data sets um, comparable? The last part of that question is, it's not even clear that the provinces want to share those data outside their jurisdiction, which I guess speaks to what Keith was speaking, speaking to earlier. So Ross, it seems like you're ready to jump in on this. You have well, that look. Yeah, <laughs> uh, 
there's really no way to, to resolve that issue uh, when the data are coming from existing administrative data sets. Uh, I learned that working with the thesis, and I want to give uh, uh, Scott Murray credit for this. I think he, he was the, the, the person who used to be at Statistics Canada for many years. Many of you uh, knew Scott. Lots of enthusiasm, lots of great ideas. And I remember talking early on about a file that would look like the pieces. And he had uh, ideas of going even more detail. But then we got into it, realized every PSE institution, to some degree, uh, their data are organized in different ways than others, or at least to a significant degree. They might use the same platforms, this sort of thing. But I remember early on uh, finding that there was a high turnover rate in one, bit, one institution. Well, it turns out that after you did a year or two of general studies and you changed your program to take on your major. And uh, that's just a single example of, uh, and, and it's tough to get around that. So uh, when you're working from administrative data uh, and provinces have different purposes, they have different sometimes systems, it's a real challenge, and I see no obvious uh, solution to it. Because um, you, can, you can't always put things together and say, okay, we can take this and merge with this, and then they'll be comparable because they're just two different. So it's one of the challenges that will always remain with these kind of data. One of the great things about the tax data, of course, is that they are uh, pretty uniform, at least. Quebec has their own provincial forms. But there you go. So it, you're right, Rizeth, it's, a, it's a real challenge, and there's in many cases um, that said, um, it, and that's important, a point to make, that said, uh, th there's another way to see this, and I'm turning it sideways, that uh, we have, in some ways, uh, 10 natural experiments within Canada. And so if we think about making comparisons without necessarily merging or making the data comparable, we can do some comparisons and see what works better than something else. Now, of course, some provinces will develop allergies about this because they don't necessarily want to say that their system doesn't work as well as others. But the point is that we can get some insights from a series of nat natural experiments. And I've always thought that we're not making enough use of this for policy analysis in Canada. The natural experiment phenomena that we have going on with provincial jurisdiction in health and education in some social programs. There's a wealth of things we could do to make comparisons. Great point. That's a great point. Um, uh, I second that. <laughs> the uh, so we have we're at coming up to about almost two now, but we've got uh, some great questions here outstanding. So with the panel's permission. I'd like to go for another 50, about 15 minutes or so, if, if everyone can stay. And we just, we have a few more questions and maybe we'll try to, about six more, but we'll try to take them come up briefly so we can make sure everyone's had their question addressed as if everyone can stay for about 15 more minutes. Um, so the next one we have here is for Keith, which is about how, how do you relate the insights you get from, from these, this kind of um, analysis back to education system and curriculum design? Um, the questioner points out that there's a lot of criticism that the education system might not be best preparing our students for the labor market, and especially in the increasingly changing economy. That, is there some direct way that what we're learning here helps to change the curriculum design to help with that? Yeah, no, no good question, um, and, and a big one. I'll try to be brief. Um, uh, you know, I, I think uh, let's look at the you know the very premise of that question uh, that we may or may not be. Uh, kind of preparing kids for for the future. Um, I don't know if that's true. That's my research question. Um, I, I want to be able to see now that we can link to and income is not the only measure of success. Uh, it's an important one, um, but but it, but it's one measure. You know, we have some other kind of proxies for well-being and happiness, and you know, this is where economists and other you know uh, kind of disciplines you know have a bun fight about uh, what is success but uh, you know this is where we need a, a good cross-section of, of academics to help us with this but you know once we get through this this kind of you know uh, conversation about what is success and we have some you know an economist word some some outcome variables that we're trying to we're trying to explain and then we go backwards right into well if, if income is a metric of success for example um, 
what schools, what post-secondary pathways, you know, kind of led itself to, uh, to the highest income? What schools are, you know, generating better outcomes for Indigenous students, uh, holding a bunch of other variables constant? Like, who is making system changes? that uh, kind of, again, helps, uh, helps kids be, be successful. And we have, we have some insight into that. Uh, and, you know, trying to linking back here into, into the curriculum uh, conversation, um, you know, this has been largely rooted over the past, you know, kind of decade or so. You know, we've had a transformation in our curriculum linked to competencies, uh, you know, those types of things that are, uh, you know, research is telling us, uh, you know, the OECD is telling us to, to focus on which, um, you know, ha has the, the greatest likelihood for, for success in the, in the labor market. Um, but we have to measure that. We, we, we have to test a kind of those, those assumptions. Um, and one example of, uh, of putting curriculum in context is, um, and I dare use the word coefficient here, um, but when we look at the things that are most powerful in explaining things like graduation and post-secondary transition, it's not curriculum design. Uh, it's, it's important, it's foundational, but things like assessment structures and networking and quality of instruction and lots of things that happen outside of a student's life uh, at home, uh, you know, kind of Susan and others have, have, have touched on, uh, those are the most powerful indicators for, for success. So, you know, I just want to put curriculum in some context that yes, it informs it and guides it, but let's also put curriculum in the context of lots of other things that drive uh, outcomes for kids. That's a great point. Great point. Um, now we have one for Susan and Ross. Again, we try to keep the answers relatively brief. Brief. Um, uh, this is more a sort of, you know, in your dream world wish list. Uh, if you could get, you know, a new data set or a new data link linkage that would advance your research or policy, what would, what would that be? When you're going to sleep at night and you're just dreaming about data and data linkages. Let Ross go first. <laughs> Oh, you're on mute there, Ross. Still on mute. Grant, are you, you host? Can you take him off mute? You can only ask him to unmute. Susan, why don't you why don't you go and then maybe Ross, if you can figure it out. Okay. Um, yeah. Too bad my ploy didn't work. Oh, um, <laughs> oh no, here there he is. He's back. Just oh, okay. Back. <laughs> yeah, uh, I would say my uh, research has generally gone uh, sort of incrementally. One of the things would be early, early childhood development. Uh, that would be a nice link that would add in my own research. Again, I'm thinking uh, the sort of data. Well, like the BC data, and I know data like that. Can be available, um, and then linking across. Uh, uh, well, there are the health outcomes, uh, which uh, that would be very interesting to link together. Um, and uh, let me leave it at that. I think that that intersection would be would be those would be two nice extensions that I would like to look at uh, if I were doing that. Susan. Okay, uh, I have two ideas, uh, and both of them are quite grandiose. Uh, one is the point that I made one in my little seven minutes, and that is moving throughout the life course so we could, we could assess outcomes. And I really like the idea of not assessing outcomes in terms of income, but outcomes on all kinds of levels that may matter as much or more than income, but assessing from early childhood education straight through. Uh, following a life course perspective. We've done some of that, but of course it's tricky because some of the data is in provincial hands. We can't get hold of it uh, so readily for K through, through 12. But nonetheless, um, I think a life course assessment from beginning to end would be quite useful to figure out what is working and what isn't. The second thing I think that we could do more of, and I sort of, it's on my dream list, would be to link across, uh, across domains. And the life course theory 
uh, which I'm very fond of, talks about linking across domains. And what Keith just said suggests that it's not only education that makes a difference, for example, to outcomes, it's also the home situation, the, the parents, well, we know that the parents' education actually matters more than income. We know that from, from already existing evidence. So exactly how does that work? And how do other aspects of par parenting practices, reading to children uh, work? And in fact, the COVID uh, epidemic has opened up the possibility to look at different educational styles from a home perspective, because some parents are very, very good at following a curriculum on a home basis. Others simply can't do it. And that means for diverging destinies for children. So I think it would be interesting to look at that across domains. That's great. They, and it also, that's great. It also brings home the sort of the value added of having sociologists and econo economists and the different perspectives that they bring uh, to the table as well. <laughs> uh, another question um, from Actually, an anonymous. Sorry, Ross. Can I add just. Uh, yes, please. Can I... Oh, now you just went back on mute, Ross. It was with the other direction. Oh. Yeah, now you're good. Uh, one of the things I've done preliminary work on this is actually linking back uh, through the tax data to earlier years than are currently available on these files. So getting at the very early influence, and I actually did some preliminary work. I've shown to some of my friends in DC, where for example, family income, when you're looking at access to post-secondary education, uh, has its greatest, greatest impact when the kids are very young, like zero to four, and when they're older, 15 and 19, with a U shape in between. And I did that, again, just working off the lad, off the uh, sort of off the corner of my desk, so to speak. And that's something uh, I've spoken to BC about it and others. Um, and that's something that uh, I think could be done that uh, I'd like. I'd, and I'd welcome the opportunity to uh, participate once again with StatsCan and uh, my policy colleagues to, uh, to make that happen to the degree I they want to do it. Great. Great. Um, we've got another question sort of for Keith or anybody else, uh, but at least keep the keys, Keith, because our time is running short. It's really about what, what where's, the gov where's the BC government um, sort of at with the sort of new methods like AI, machine learning, and putting together the, the kinds of data that you're talking about, um, given that the government has access to these so many data sets that could potentially be put together with some form of machine learning or AI. Yeah, no. And so we're, we're on that path. Um, you know, in a government context, I'd, I'd say we got some, um, uh, some pretty powerful things that, that we've done to date uh, in respect to the private sector, probably not overly advanced, but um, you know, one particular example where uh, you know, we've really got into is, you know, we do uh, kind of surveys of, of students. So we have, you know, things like a student survey with 100,000 records. But what's unique about that survey is we've linked it to our personal education number. So when you get start to get insights from students uh, and their reflections about learning now linked to uh, assessment information and then therefore linked to other data sets that are now in the research network, you know, that becomes a quite, quite a powerful triangle. But the, the gap has always been open text, open survey responses, kind of things like that. So, and this, this is where I start to feel old. Uh, you know, we got analysts coming in now that just have exceptional skill sets and capabilities where they are deploying machine learning to analyze like 30, 40,000 uh, open text responses, you know, developing algorithms and patterns about uh, insights into what gives kids, kids stress and anxiety that, uh, you know, they're not going to fill out a Likert scale. Uh, about what gives them stress and anxiety. You have to pull that and extract that and we're using very kind of sophisticated methods. So we've done some of that work. Uh, you know, I think it's quite, uh, quite pioneering from our, from our team to kind of explore that types of things. And then linking it to schools, linking it to, again, outcome measures that, you know, how, what's the relationship between, you know, having a sense of belonging in a school to the stress and anxiety that's there, to the extent of bullying, to outcome behavior or to outcome results. Uh, like those are, those are big education policy questions that, um, you know, we've started to do. We've got a few other tidbits that we're working on, but um, that's an example for today. That's great. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ross, please, yeah, quickly. 
Yeah, uh, very quick. Uh, I'm, I'm open. Okay. We actually did some work with, with BC uh, where we looked at uh, on time graduation uh, through K 12, and we developed predictive models uh, using quite advanced uh, machine learning techniques. And we found that, in particular, the grade four and grade uh, seven FSA scores, foundational skills assessments. Uh, so, as of grade five and grade eight in particular, uh, we could come up with pretty good predictions of which students were uh, much less likely to graduate on time, which would then, if that could be put into practice, so uh, those students would perhaps be targeted for uh, support initiatives, with its support initiatives. So, yeah. and for a lot of data there, uh, the techniques are, so, and it's great, the stuff that Keith and his shop is doing, so, yeah, if, room. If, if, if I may, Dan, just very, very quickly, that's another good example that I think, um, you know, researchers might be, might be interested in, um, you know, a massive achievement for analytics to be able to have that degree of precision on predictability, but extremely unfortunate from a public policy perspective that, you know, we have markers where if this, this, and this happens, you know, in, in, a, in a child's life, and, and we've done all the retrospective sensitivity analysis going back. It is it is remarkably accurate those uh, kind of prediction models. So mm -hmm. uh, again, that's another example where we we kind of deployed that AI and would like to do more of it. Okay, fantastic. That's that's also just one area too where I think from the researcher side we could benefit from involving more people who are working on these methods or developing them, like computer scientists and en engineers who haven't really got into the uh, the RDCs that much. Okay, we just have two more questions, and so let's please be brief. Here's one oh, for Keith from, oh, from none other than Umit uh, Kitzeltan, who's uh, also a CDRGC and board member, and he'll be speaking on the October 20th panel on ethnic and racial issues. Um, his question's for Keith, and it's a very specific one that uh, IRC, he's from IRCC, has already linked the immigration microdata with BC data at the Population Data BC. And that's been really valuable um, for getting insight on the health conditions and challenges of immigrants in BC. He's interested in if you can possibly adopt a similar approach to the K, to K through 12 and post-secondary education, to putting that together with immigrants and, and refugees. Yes. All right. <laughs> there we go. So you, we're going to need to put you two together <laughs> after this, and then we'll make it happen. <laughs> Is like a nice, there we go, to the point. Uh, last question then uh, for Susan. Uh, in your uh, research and, and, and policy uh, findings on education and social development over the years, what has surprised you the most? <laughs> um, in 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I guess what surprised me is, um, is that expectations matter. And this relates to what Keith was saying too, that expectations matter. So it's not simply a direct line from educational attainment or income to an outcome. It's what you expect to get out of that education and out of that income. Expectations matter. And that surprised me. Oh, that's great, that's great. And here we are right on time. Um, thank you, everybody, to all of our panelists for a really stimulating uh, conversation. And thank you to the audience for so many uh, really on-point uh, questions and the dialogue that it generated. Um, I think that closes our session for, the, for today. I do want to make sure everybody um, knows about our next session upcoming um, tomorrow, which will, is a spotlight on... Um, sorry, I just lost it here. Oh yeah, so, so spotlight on immigration and settlement tomorrow, October 7, uh, same time, same place. Uh, and so if you can make it to that, we would love to see you there. Thanks everybody uh, for uh, a really great session. And if we could all give a round of applause virtually to our panelists, that would be fantastic. Have a, uh, have a, have a, have a good afternoon, morning or evening, depending on your time zone. Thanks, Dan. Thanks everybody. Thank you.